This is John Jackson Miller, and you're listening to the Star Wars Canon Podcast. May the Force be with you. There are stories about what happened. It's true. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 46 of the Star Wars Canon Podcast. I am your host, Brian Miller, and I'm so glad you decided to join me to talk about our favorite thing in the world yet again, Star Wars. And as always, I have got my faithful companion from all the way across the pond, from me at least. I don't know where you guys are at, but the one and only Mr. Lovely J. Hi, uh, lovely, I, your name's Lovely J now, man. The lovely well, Richard. You, yeah, the lovely Richard J. How's it going, buddy? Oh, thank you very much for that uh, beautiful introduction. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm I'm doing great, man. I got me a little glass of some peach whiskey here to kind of relax a little bit. We're recording this on a Friday night, and we're going to be putting it up tomorrow night on Saturday. So uh, it's my Friday night. After the two weeks I've had, uh, I needed a little bit of a a capper to the week, so uh, trying to relax a little bit. And I figured, you know, what the hell? Let's just uh, have a drink and talk some Star Wars. So. Uh, real quick, before we get going, I know last week uh, Richard J. nor I were here, uh, and I wanted to give a shout out to Usuf Wally, uh, JG, and uh, Steven, because they did a hell of a job running last week's episode. Um, I wanted to, to, to put that out there, and thank you guys so much for supporting them. A lot of the feedback that we got on that episode was really, really good. And uh, I really I wanted to acknowledge that they, they put, uh, did put out a hell of an episode. And considering what the topics were, and how, you know, touchy and controversial one of them was. I'm awful damn proud of how they did. So uh, I wanted to throw that out there as well. This week, we have got a hell of an episode lined up. For, you know, the last couple episodes, the news has been kind of slow. Not a lot to talk about here and there. You know you know what I'm saying? So we've kind of been stretching for news stories. Tonight is completely different. We've got plenty to talk about. So, uh, Jay, are you ready to get into this, man? Ready and waiting. Let's jump into this. So from now on, what we're going to be doing is splitting the show into some different segments. So it's a little easier for you guys to maybe skip through if you want to find a certain segment you guys want to listen to uh, before anything else. So this week, if you guys look on this side of the screen, if I can figure out where I'm pointing, that logo is going to be gone next week. And it's going to be a list of all these segments that we can go through. So uh, this week, we're going to go ahead and go segment by segment. And this week, uh, we're going to start with films. We've got uh, something we wanted to talk about with the film section, which is kind of weird because this isn't really news. It's more, uh, uh, it's a rumor. This is definitely rumor mill stuff. Um, but Jay, man, you you seem pretty convinced uh, of what's getting ready to happen. The rumor right now is that Ryan Johnson is still working on his trilogy, that it's still going to happen. Uh, we haven't had any official announcements on this whatsoever. Uh, I think I just heard fanboys' heads explode across uh, the, the the world, and you know, this there was no there was no mention of this whatsoever during the Disney investors call. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of wondering where you know if we're going to be getting anything on this before long. If there's anything to this, Jay, you seem pretty convinced, man. What's what what's going on on your end? Yeah. Okay. So Soraya Wilson um, was interviewing. Ryan Johnson, I believe it was in regards to a project he's working on called Knives Out. Now, Soraya follows Ryan Johnson on Twitter, and Ryan Johnson followed her back. And she stated on her Twitter that she spoke with Ryan Johnson, who confirmed that these films were still going ahead. Now, again, we've not had any confirmation from Lucasfilm, but... He never rebuted those claims I on Twitter. He could have turned around and said, look, that's not quite true, or not to say that. Uh, the fact that he hasn't come out and said, no, actually, that's not quite the case, or, you know, it's, it's still in the, it's still in the you know, decision. Well, for me, I'm going to put my eggs in that basket and say it's happening. Now, I don't think it's going to be anything that we're going to see anytime soon. It could very well be that, I don't know, the, I, with these films, I don't know, I don't even know what direction they're going to go in. No, nobody does. Is it going to be something that's set in the High Republic era? 
or are we going to get something that's brand new, completely removed from the Skywalker saga and the High Republic? I have no idea. I don't think it's something we're going to see for quite some time. I think it's just going to be one of those projects where when he gets the time to do it, because it's going to be a big undertaking, three movies, I think when he gets that available time, then he'll start to 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 really put down his thoughts on what this trilogy could be. I uh I I was kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum until I talked to you earlier, um, and and you kind of told me that you had seen that tweet and kind of talking about that this was you know actually going to happen. We still haven't heard anything from Lucasfilm, and it's kind of curious that we didn't hear anything because it was it was blatantly absent from the investors call because that was something that a lot of people have really talked about we've even talked about it on this show about how that was still happening whether you liked it or not and we had to admit you know hey they didn't say anything about that during the investors call now granted everything during that call is subject to change you know what i mean especially with this whole cara dune gina carano rangers of the new republic thing we that's kind of up in the air right now so we could be sitting on the go button for an announcement about a Ryan Johnson trilogy. And, and l- let me ask you this, Jay, considering how, right, The Last Jedi was received, do you think we're far enough removed from that to have mm-hmm. everybody kind of welcome the idea of him maybe taking another crack at it? Because keep in mind, this is, and, and not just you, Jay, everybody, everybody listening to this right now, keep in mind, He's going to be writing a whole new trilogy, if this is true, with characters we've never seen before. He's not going to have, you know, these these characters that we all know and love at his disposal. It's going to be characters he comes up with. Do you think that would be better suited, and do you think people are going to accept that more? Well, I think from... I think giving him the artistic freedom to make new characters uh, would be uh, certainly more beneficial to him as a storyteller. Right. Um, but... I mean, these three movies, these could go straight to Disney+. Plus. That's true. It doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be three huge theatrical releases. Um, in terms of how far enough we are away from the feelings that The Last Jedi stirred up in a good portion of the fan base, yeah, as I said earlier, this might not be something we see for a long time. Mm-hmm. It could just be, this idea is on the table. You've got three movies if you want to make them. Okay, fine. Yeah, I'll do those three movies. There might not be an actual date yet set in stone for this, so it might not be something we don't see at all for the next five years. I I tend to think you're right. Yeah. By which point, Disney Plus will be in absolute full swing. All these shows will be on there. You know, Marvel will be kicking out TV shows every every few months, so Disney Plus will be in full swing with what they're doing. Aside, you know, along with all the other new content that they're bringing in. And that's when we could start to see news then of these movies. Because bearing in mind, we're working on High Republic now, and you know um, what's what's the shelf life for High Republic? That's well, that's what five five years or so. Mm, yeah, estimated five years. There might not be something we get to hear anything of until after the until all this is finished. Right. You know, who well, knows? They could say to him, "Go back to the old Republic." All right, cool. We'll see how High Republic goes out and we'll you know we can use then some of the things in high republic and set them up in old republic who knows bring up drink bring drew carpician back in and co-write the movies with drew carpician the the guy that wrote the bane trilogy the Revan novels the mass effect trilogy oh, yes the guy that wrote the kotor games you know that would be cool he's he's the one that completely fleshed out that entire time period you know and and yeah that, that that'd be cool but yeah no I, like i said i i tend to take this with a grain of salt like you said it's probably years down the road um, because I think you said that he's got other projects lined up too. Knives Out is is already out. Uh, and I, has he got some other things he's working on? I don't remember. I haven't looked at his, uh, like his future projects or anything. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 probably well removed because, like you said, High Republic, you know, last three, four, five years. Then we got Rogue Squadron coming. We've got the Taika Waititi film coming that we still haven't got an announcement on. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, about what that is or whatever like that. So, yeah, I mean, there, that, that means there's other film announcements coming down the line. You know, we've got the, the Taika Waikiki thing coming still. So there's a possibility this could be right around the corner and be getting ready to, to being announced. So I guess time will tell. Like I said, take it with a grain of salt and uh, be civil in the comments talking about that because I know how people get talking about Ryan Johnson and uh, 
Just just keep it civil is all I ask. So that was really all the film news to kind of talk about. Let's move on to books. So we've got a couple things we wanted to talk about in the uh, the book genre. I didn't even know this until I sat down and start putting show notes together. Uh, but I guess I, this is kind of cool. I'm kind of excited about this. E.K. Johnston is working on the third book and what I didn't know was going to be a trilogy uh, of the, 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 the Queen's trilogy, I guess you could say, called Queen's Hope. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm excited about this one, man. Uh, Jay, I don't know if you've read Queen's Shadow or Queen's Peril. Uh, but for me personally, I really, really dug Queen's Shadow. I absolutely adored Queen's Shadow. It's one of my, it, 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 it's a great, great book, especially considering there's not a lot of Padme content. Um, Queen's Peril was okay. Uh, have you, have you read either of these? And if, if so, I mean, kind of what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I've read them all. I mean, I, in my notes here, I've also written it down as book three in the Queen trilogy. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much how I just wrote it down as well. But I'm looking forward to it because I think this could, I mean, this particular book uh, is going to be centered around Padme adjusting to her role as being a wartime senator um, and a wife, a secret wife. So, you know, we're getting, you know, pretty. Juicy stuff. Pretty far, pretty far in of her yeah. life. This is where everything starts to fall apart, and it's um, or the, the beginning of the end for Padme. You know, mm-hmm. um, and you know it's it's what I'm looking forward to seeing. I was watching the the Star Wars show, and they were talking about this is where Padme gets to see the harsh realities of the front line. Mm-hmm. So that I'm looking forward to seeing how that impacts on on her as a character. And in the Star Wars show as well, they were also talking that you know, the the the, the shadowy figure of Palpatine looming in the background. So you know we're getting you know this is a run up now to the end for pardon me. So as to how long the book's going to run for, is it going to be something that just focuses on a small chapter of the Clone Wars, or are we going to go right the way up to Revenge of the Sith? That would be brilliant. Right. Just like we had the Rogue uh, the Rogue One novels, the Catalyst, uh, Rebel Rising. Then the Rogue One novel, those three novels that chronicled um, the life of Jyn Erso. Mm-hmm. Are we going to get now a trilogy for, for, you know, for what I you know? Yeah, the Queen's trilogy to, to chronicle Padme's life, you know? So it would be great if it goes all the way up to Revenge of the Sith. That would be great. See, that that's the only thing that I'm kind of worried about with this book. Because, uh, like I said, I love Queen's Shadow. Queen's Peril was good, as far as I was concerned. But when it started to cross over with Episode One. Uh, and kind of tell episode one from her point of view, it seemed like, and this is just me personally, it seemed like that book kind of sped up and just kind of became an abridged version of The Phantom Menace. And I don't want to see that same thing necessarily with Revenge of the Sith. And I'm hoping that, yeah, I mean, there's probably going to be aspects of it there because it talks about her, you know, the fall of the Republic through, through Padme's eyes. I just hope that they bring uh, the ek johnston brings enough new content to the table because padme was a secondary side character in revenge of the sith she was i mean she was completely cast to the side just i mean this this strong badass female character from clone wars and she just uh, i mean she didn't have hardly any screen time in revenge of the sith so i'm hoping they kind of flesh out her character arc in revenge of the sith if, if she's going to do this and and really kind of redeem what they what they did to her and in, in three. Well, the thing to take into consideration as well with Revenge of the Sith, she's pregnant. She's heavily right. pregnant, so the character is withdrawn a little bit in hiding. She can no longer go out, you know, on the front lines of Geonosis right. because she's carrying what she thinks is one child. Turns out to be twins. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but you know. Um, so it would make sense to me that the character would withdraw slightly because nobody is supposed to know, aside from her personal team, nobody knows that she's married or pregnant. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, aside from those who see it on a daily basis, they would notice that she was pregnant. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, um, in, in regards to the abridged story, that is also a risk. But, you know, look at Claudia Gray. She bridged three movies. That's true, yeah. In, in one novel. So, as but as you said, you know, it wasn't just a case of let's talk about this part of Star Wars, let's talk about this part of Empire Strikes Back. 
let's talk about this part of Return of the Jedi. No, you had key moments, but you had all that extra content around it. Started off but a decade before the original movie, ended five years after the Return of the Jedi. And you had this weave going throughout the entire book, connecting those little dots together through the original trilogy with these two new characters. So, you know, E.K. Johnson can certainly do it with, you know, with if this goes from, you know, this is going to be, you know, after Attack of the Clones. Uh, so it's going to be in the run-up, you know, potentially could be in the run-up to Revenge of the Sith. Right. Uh, I don't know if they're going to, I don't know if it's going to be a completely brand new story, if they're going to reference moments from Attack of the Clones or the Clone Wars TV show. That would be nice to see something referenced, you know, from the show. Mm -hmm. Um Otherwise, you could get into sticky water. Uh, you could get into a sticky part spot where you're telling a story about a character's journey and then negating to mention any of the elements from the Clone Wars TV show. You know, or even the senator. What's what's the... I forgot his name. The male senator that comes to see an Anakin beats the living daylights out of him. Oh. What's that guy's name? Do you remember that guy's name? Oh, I... Was it? I don't remember. I don't want to say Corvus. Corvus was the that was the name of the the ship that uh, uh, Inferno Squad had. I, I feel like it was, wasn't it? I don't know, but you know, uh, yeah, but, I don't know. I'll, it doesn't matter. But but uh, either way, we could you know Clovis. You could bring, Clovis. You could you could bring him. You know, get your hands off. It was Clovis. Him, yeah. Him. But you know, you could maybe you know segue him into the book, flesh out that relationship a bit more. Yeah. But when you watch the clones, you get ah, now I can see why Anakin's pasting him completely against the wall. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I, I know I'm mean, I think she'll be fine. I, you know, I I've read the other two novels; they were okay. I yeah. I enjoyed the 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 two previous uh, part of my book. So oh, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to finishing off that trilogy. Fair enough. Well, we'll be able to do that on uh, November 2nd. That is the release date for Queen's Hope as of now, uh, November 2nd, 2021. So uh, keep a uh, keep an eye out for that one. And we'll let you guys know as soon as we get our hands on it. And we'll, uh, we'll let you know our thoughts. Also coming out this year on August 3rd is the Secrets of the Sith reference book. This is, I guess, a sequel book to the Secrets of the Jedi. Is that what this yeah. is? I'm assuming so. Uh, I haven't looked at anything on secrets of the jedi yet and that was, secrets of the jedi was from luke's point of view correct that's right so this, this one from, is palpatine right that's it yes yeah, palpatine's perspective so, okay um yes yeah, a children's reference book uh due to be released august this year um narrated by palpatine so hopefully it'll be better than eight of the jedi which was through <laughs> luke's perspective uh, i've not read secrets of the jedi uh it, it's a reference book so maybe it's worthwhile picking up right because they do give a lot of tidbits out to to other parts of star wars which doesn't get included into the movies or even into any books or, co or comic form but they could mention you know as they have done in other visual dictionaries or visual guides they'll drop a little bit of knowledge in there something that you'll never see mentioned again oh yeah just some bit of background knowledge which is which might be cool for a bit of trivia yeah no you're right uh but yeah that's set for release on august 3rd i'm gonna have to pay more attention to the reference material because that's one thing that i have like sorely lacked on and i need to start getting these because they're, like you said there's these little tidbits in these books that you'll never see mentioned anywhere else and do i feel like some of the, some of the stuff that they explain needs to be explained on screen yeah sure absolutely but i get that you know, they, they want to sell books and, oh, if you want to know that secret or, you know, for that, you must pay, you know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. Um, yeah. So I need to start, I need to start getting these reference books and I got a lot of catching up to do on them. Um, yeah. I think, I think the thing to take away from it all as well is what with Filoni and Favreau, you know, going forward now with this, um, the, what's been commonly referred to as the Filoni verse or the Favreau verse. Right. You can guarantee, just like Filoni did in Rebels, you know, especially specifically with with the Thrawn, you know, when you look at some of Thrawn's artwork in the background. I mean, you had the Holy Grail was in there. Mm -hmm. um, you look at uh, the Solo movie, all those artifacts that Dryden Voss had, you know, in his office. It's it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of the stuff that you can find in these reference books ended up in the background of some of Filoni's shows. Oh yeah. So, you know, although it might not be integral 
uh, integral to uh, the plot of any of the shows, you know, it may very well be a nice little Easter egg if you can physically. You know, oh yeah, that's that's from this book that I was reading. That's you know, you know so it would be nice. You know, it's I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some of the stuff in these books wind up uh, in the background of some of Filoni's shows. No, you're 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 completely right, man. Because. Uh, I mean, that's already happened quite a few times, actually. You know, you brought up Dryden Voss's room, you know, and and the novel for Solo uh, kind of touched on some of that stuff a little bit. And it, that little, like, four-legged creature looked like a Pokemon in their glass was actually alive. <laughs> mm, well, uh, it was just standing stuff. perfectly still because he didn't, it didn't want Dryden to kill him. It was just little stuff like that, you know? So, yeah, I'm going to have to start getting some of these reference books. I've got... I think I got the first one that covered the first six movies before Force Awakens came out. I have that one, but that's the only one. So I need to start picking some of those up. But uh, let's move on to comics. What say you? Uh, there was a pretty big announcement that came out uh, earlier this week. Well, first off, StarWars.com teased uh, 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 this this image of Boba Fett. Uh, said Marvel up in the corner said Boba Fett nowhere to hide. And it's Boba Fett with his like battle axe spear looking thing. And uh, I got excited as hell when I saw this because obviously Marvel, I'm sitting here thinking we're getting a Boba Fett comic. This is going to be awesome because that's kind of what I wanted in Bounty Hunters and I was a little <laughs> let down And then uh, uh, with, with the Bounty Hunters comic. But then they came out with the announcement that this War of the Bounty Hunters mega crossover event is happening not only with – because, I mean, every crossover we've had so far – was between like two comics, right? This mm. one is crossing every single ongoing series that Marvel is putting out right now, oh, uh, with an exception of High Republic. Uh, and this thing looks absolutely sick. So basically what the story of this is, it's set between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And this, I mean, this comic basically null and void Shadows of the Empire. And it, tells this story that, I mean, it's it's no spoiler, they've already put out, at the beginning of this comic, Boba Fett is no longer in possession of Han Solo. And That's right. And he's on a mission to go get his prize back. Uh, I think, I, at this point, I don't think I've ever been this excited for a comic crossover event. I, I this, this thing sounds absolutely balls-to-the-wall, ridiculous, fanboy, gratuitous, glorious badassery. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I'm I'm over the top ready for this comic. Uh, and, it's, yeah. and it doesn't even start until May. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's it's going to start with its own prelude comic. Uh, it, what is it? Uh, 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 War of the Bounty Hunters War Alpha, I think Alpha. is what you said it was. Yeah. And then it's going to cross over with Star Wars 13, Darth Vader 12, Bounty Hunters 12, and Dr. Aphra 10. And those five issues are going to be the ones that tell this story. And obviously we know how it's going to end, right? But still yeah. to see, I mean, because think about it. Han Solo was like the bounty to catch in the galaxy. And Boba Fett got him no problem. Hook, line, sinker. Outsmarted all these other bounty hunters, if you've read uh, from a certain point of view, Empire. He outsmarted every last one of them. And got Han and took off with him. And... I want to know which bounty hunter got him, got Han from from Boba, how he did it, and how pissed off Boba Fett is. <laughs> I'm ready, man. W w what say you? Because I've rambled. I'm just, I'm so stupid excited. What about you, man? Well, I remember when the image came out of uh, of Batlax wielding Fett, you know, yes. Batlax Fett, and we were talking about it, you know, on on Facebook, and. Um, now, for those of you of a certain generation, you know, if you if you own a Genesis, you know, Mega Drive for those in the UK, Genesis, you know, for for you guys over uh, in the in the states, for me, all I saw was the dwarf from Golden Axe. You know, <laughs> now if, if you if you babies and you don't know, you don't know because you babies, and that's cool. Go and ask your dad. Go and ask your older brother. But Golden Axe, <laughs> the, everyone played as the dwarf in green armor with the big, big battle axe. Uh, that's the vibe that I got from the picture. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really psyched to see this, especially as well. After watching The Mandalorian, seeing so much content on A Mandalorian, how they can act, seeing the new Boba Fett, you know, in The Mandalorian, um, that you know, I'm more excited now than ever to see more. Boba Fett, 
you know, in any medium. I know we've got the TV show coming towards the end of this year, but um, I'm more excited now than I ever was to see Boba Fett. We are, we are a, we've been blessed. We've been blessed with Battle Axe Fett. Oh, we're being and, spoiled. Uh, Sega. What's happening? <laughs> we got Battle Axe Fett. I can't wait. I, dude, I, because <laughs> I don't remember who dropped it in the chat first, um, but somebody, maybe it was JG, I think it was JG, dropped it in our chat, and I, I was like, wait, what the, f what is this, what, no way, and I was like, oh man, and then Kirsty sent me the actual link before everybody else did of what it actually was, and I, oh my god, am I kind of sad that this null and voids Shadows of the Empire as it is, yeah, Pretty kind brilliant. of. Do what? You don't know yet. You don't know what's in the comics. Well, that's true. You're yeah, right. We don't know that. If you remember, it, it happens Shadows during that same Empire. period. Yeah. If you remember, Shadows of the Empire, the video game, was told all from Dash Rendar's perspective. That's true. Yeah. The novel was told from uh, predominantly the Rebellion's perspective. But it was scattered, you know, because it's telling a novel. You see a bit from uh, Shizo's point of view, a bit from the Rebellion. Right. You know, this could be something else. You know, I mean, it's not going to follow Shadows of the Empire, but it would no. be nice if this was Boba Fett's um, perspective of Shadows of the Empire. That would be great. That would be freaking awesome. And then they could re-release the novel, the game, yes. and the soundtrack. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, man. You, you're you tickling my childhood right now because Shadows of the Empire was that, that Nintendo 64 game. That was life. Mm. For me, that was life. That and yeah. Goldeneye. That was life. That's it. Yeah. And I and I even have that Shadows of the Empire game on an emulator on the on my computer. And uh, I'm still waiting for it to appear on the Xbox Game Store. Uh, yes. I swear yeah. to God. <laughs> if Shadows that happened, of the Empire and Rogue Squadron on the N64 was yes. just was everything. That uh, racer, you know, episode one racer came out as well. Right. Uh, which was a great game. Uh, to play on the N64. It was really good fun. But yeah, Shadows of the Empire was the first Star Wars game that I played. I don't play on PC. I only play on console. So it was the first console game that I played, Star Wars console game, where I thought, damn, you know, I, I'm, I'm in. I'm in this. The music is spot on. Um, they take all this inspired music from John Williams and they piece it all together to make new music. And um, I'd never even read the novel up to this point. So when oh, I actually God, it's such a good picked book, up yeah. the novel, several years later, I was expecting to follow the story of Dash Render, a, li a little bit taken aback by the fact that he's barely mentioned in the book. Like right. one time he's mentioned in the book. But then I realized there after doing a bit of research that it was all published, the game, the novel, the soundtrack, all at the same time to be this big multimedia Action story. figures. They did action figures for this thing, too. That's it, Chewbacca. The power of the force figure. Oh, yeah, Chew Chewie with a flat top. I remember that. The the Luke Skywalker and the Imperial Guard outfit. Like the, the yeah. That was where the Leia Bausch figure came from uh, originally. Because in that book, she gets that that uh, that outfit, which actually has been... that's That doesn't happen in, in a Shadows of the Empire story anymore. Now we know she got that from Maz Kanata instead of Giri. Uh, but it's, yeah, man, maybe, maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe there'll be some elements of Shadows of the Empire in this comic because it's only five issues, but you can do a lot in five issues with, with an original story like this. Uh, I, dude, I'm, 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 I'm dying, especially since this year, later this year, we're getting Book of Boba Fett and, you know, he's, like you said, he made his appearance in Mando. Boba Fett's coming back, man. And now that they finally revealed, yep, he made it out. We're doing is like, they are going to completely... Milk that character for everything they can. Oh yeah, oh, and, and, and as they should. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like that's a character yeah. that they know I'm fans want. With my milk yeah. bucket on my stool. Just give me the udders. I'll milk yes. it myself. Bring me the cow. I'll do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, keep in mind also some of the crossover events that they've done have kind of fallen a little flat. the The coolest one was Vader down, in my opinion. I loved Vader down. Um, Screaming Citadel was kind of weird. The one with Star Wars and Afra crossing over, because it was Screaming it was Citadel, like the was that? It, that was the one with like the force sucking the vampires. vampires. Yeah, and it was kind of different. Oh, that was ass. Yeah, oh, and, that was awesome. That was yeah, so and then we did. Were, were those the only two crossover events we've done so far? Oh, I don't know. I, mean, I think it so is. That's, that's been out that I'm. You know, even I'm starting to lose track of all the crossovers. Right. I'm pretty sure those are the only ones. 
Um, we did get that Empire Senate comic that kind of, but they they didn't really cross over. It was just, but but anyway, yeah, I'm excited for this. I to to see a five issue run told within the confines of these other stories that actually makes sense. A bounty hunters comic, a Vader. I want to see how Vader plays into this. That was the other thing because that's kind of the wild card, considering Vader's the one that handed Solo over to Boba Fett. So I'm kind of curious how this's going to p- play out in that Vader comic, and and Afro because all these comics are happening concurrently. They're all happening the exact same time, all between Empire and Jedi. So, this is going well, to be absolutely great. The thing to remember, the thing to take away though from Vader, is, well, we, we you know we've got the the current Vader run. We know where Vader is right now. Right. Um. So I don't think Vader's going to have any time for Boba. Because it's based after Empire Strikes Back and Vader's on a mission right now. Right. Um. Yeah. Um. Which we can talk about. Later, in, in some of the mail bag questions, mm-hmm. otherwise we won't end up doubling up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we know where Vader is right now, and I don't expect to see him at all in in the bounty hunt in the the War of the Bounty Hunters comics. Yeah, you think it's just going to be under a Vader title? Well, I mean, all right, there will be that one element, that with one the issue, Darth yeah. Title, but I, I don't think Vader will have much of a presence at all. Really, um, in 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 this run of comics, uh, aside from the one the one crossover. Um, but I, I don't think Vader's going to give. Um, uh, I don't think Vader's going to care about Han Solo uh, being, you know, being lost uh, because at this moment in time he's washed his hands of it. Yeah, yeah, he, he's more. He's got other pressing things on his mind right now. Fair enough. Well, that crossover event is set to start on May fifth with that prelude comic, and man, I <laughs> I cannot freaking wait for that one. I'm so excited. So. Uh, let's move on. Uh, television and animation. Let's get into this uh, segment. We've got a little bit of news. This is part of the rumor mill. Please take this with a huge grain of salt. That uh, Jay actually just found this right before we decided to start recording. And uh, I guess that there is a rumor going around right now that Mina Masood... Did I say his name right, Jay? Yeah. Uh, Mina Masood, who played Aladdin in the live-action Aladdin film is in the final stages to be cast as the grown-up Ezra Bridger for the uh, live-action television shows. And, Jay, you brought up uh, an, an interesting point that, you know, they got the live-action Aladdin to play the Star Wars version of Aladdin. So uh, what do you think of this? You're the one that found this story. I didn't know anything about it until I got on the call with you, and we had to throw it into the show notes real quick. What do you think about this, if this is true? If, big if. Well- well, that that's the, the part. It was confirmed by a YouTube channel called Castle Run Transmissions. Okay. And they stated that they confirmed that Mina Masood is in the final stages of signing on with with Disney for for this venture. Okay. Now they don't state their sources, so I don't know how they can confirm it. Um, but uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt, mine until until we hear anything official from Lucasfilm or Disney. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, as you as you just said, you know, we've now got Space Aladdin, which you know, if you think back to the start of Rebels, especially you know, season one, that's exactly what Ezra Bridger was. He was the Aladdin character. He was roaming the streets. I think even Kanan uh, even refers to him as a street rat. Yeah. In like the first in the first episode or the second episode, um, you know, very early on in the in the show, um, so you know, I mean, the guy can act. He's got his acting chops. Oh, absolutely. Um, me personally, I would have uh, preferred Raul Carly, but uh, you know, I just love Raul Carly on Twitter. The guy is hilarious, and I love <laughs> and I love Raul Carly's work. Now, don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against Mina's work. I think Mina would work just as well. Um, but I don't know if it's going to, I don't know if it is officially confirmed. They seem to suggest it's confirmed that he's in the final stages of signing a contract, but they've not given any sources. So I don't know how they've got this uh, news off. It's just nothing but rumor. Mm-hmm. I've no idea. But as, you know, I've, I've got no real opinion on him being cast because ultimately it's a character that I would have, don't get me wrong, Taylor Gray would have been my choice. Um, you know, keep the live action characters, uh, you know, uh, in line with the animated version if and when possible. Right. I think Taylor Gray looks enough like Ezra Bridger that he could just do it himself. 
But, um, you know, it is what it is. If they want to cast somebody else, fine. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, no, I'm 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 pretty excited about this. Uh, if this turns out to be true, because out of all the live action Disney films, I really did like the Aladdin one. And maybe it's because, you know, I'm like madly in love with Naomi Scott. I don't know. Maybe that has something to do with it. Uh, but I really did like the, uh, the the live action Aladdin, and I thought he was brilliant in it. And like you said, he's got the acting chops, and he looks. I mean, let me let me pull this picture up again for everybody. Uh, I mean, he looks like he could play. And obviously, the picture of Ezra Bridger is you know is that a, that's a fan rendition, isn't it? Uh, with, with the beard and whatnot, I, he could definitely pull it off. You know, put some blue contacts on him, and and off we go. Or this could be one of those things where you know Ezra's blue eyed though. I didn't I didn't realize that till just now looking at this picture, and he's got brown eyes. Maybe it's a Saw Gerrera thing where every time we get a version of Saw Gerrera, his eye color's different. But uh, <laughs> yeah. but but uh, I'm cool with it, man. I I don't think I wouldn't count on getting uh, a, a an official announcement anytime soon because this is basic. If they announce that he's going to play a live action Ezra Bridger. Well, then who are we going to be looking for in all of the upcoming episodes of Mandalorian and in and, and the Ahsoka show? You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to know he's coming at some point. And Disney likes to yeah. drop bombs. Yeah. You know, they like to I... surprise us. So I wouldn't expect to see anything about a live action Ezra Bridger officially for Until quite some up. time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm in total agreement with you. I think the moment we find out who's playing Ezra Bridger is the minute Ezra Bridger pops up on our team. That's screens. right. Yeah. I completely agree with you. Uh, I mean, especially considering, look at the Luke Skywalker thing. No, literally nobody saw that coming. I mean, oh, I've just stopped crying. Over yeah, that. and, and it's, <laughs> but the All fact that every still, single person still. that worked on that episode kept it under wraps, and that was one thing that never leaked. It never leaked, and you know, they. they I don't know how to. <laughs> I hope this is true. But like I said, I'm taking it with a grain of salt. But if, like you said, when we find out who's playing the live action Ezra Bridger, will be when he pops up on screen. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But still very excited for it. Definitely going to be looking for him because I think we all know where all these shows are going to end up going, and it just makes sense that he's going to be there. But don't tease us that you're actually casting him because then we're going to know for sure that he's coming. And I would rather just. This is one of those things I would rather be anxious and not know and then just be surprised when it pops up, you know, so. Well, he's going to have to show up. Otherwise, he'll just yeah. raise more questions than answers. Right. I mean, Especially with always... the Thrawn name drop that we exactly. got. Yeah, so. so... You know, uh, so th that's one of the, the talking points I have with a lot of people at the season two finale of Mandalorian. When everyone, a couple of people I spoke to was expecting Ezra to show up, yeah, which made no sense to me whatsoever. When Ezra shows up, I've got more questions. Where, where have you been? Why are you here with, uh, <laughs> with Grogu? Was way strong? What have, you done? what have you done? You just abandoned your post or something? Yeah. Um, you never you went know, back to see your friends in the rebellion again. We, you know, we're looking for Thrawn. So Ezra and I'm assuming Ezra and Thrawn are going to be in close knit with yeah. each other, close proximity. Um, and I think, you know, so, yeah, we're going to get... Uh, Absolutely. Ezra, but uh, whether or not he has a cameo in the Ahsoka TV show, mm -hmm. um, or is that cameo kind of left off the table until later, I don't know. See, I, that's the thing, too, because you also have to keep in mind, too, if they do announce something official, let's say somewhere down the line they do, what is, I mean, you got to start looking at what's the next project they're getting ready to start working on. Oh, it's going to be Ahsoka? Well, shit, now we know he's going to pop up in the Ahsoka series. You know, so, like, even if they did put something out, they'd have to be careful about the placement because it's going to be easy to figure out where it's going to be. And then that surprise is going to fall flat, you know? So, yeah, I, I, dude, you want to know something. I was just thinking, too, while you were talking about Thrawn and Ezra. Um, not only do I want to see those two in this live action, like Filoni verse that everybody's calling it. But I also, once we see him in that Filoni verse, I want a novel to come out to completely chronicleize, like chronicleize everything that they were doing, like a buddy cop that like, like buddy cops that just hate each other stranded somewhere on a planet or, you know what I'm saying? Like trying to figure out how yeah. to get back and having to work together, even though they hate each other's guts. I want to see something like that. And 
I think it'd be, yeah, I think it'd make for a great story. And you're going to have to fill in that gap too. You can't just say, oh, hey, they launched into hyperspace pre a new hope. And then all of a sudden they're back and not tell exactly what happened in between, you know, yeah, in some they, form or fashion, there's a lot there to cover and you're not going to do it with just a couple of cameos. Yeah. It'll either be a novel or it'll be a series of comics right. to fill that gap in. Um, either yeah, way I'd I mean, be happy. Yeah. I mean, ultimately you're left with really two options. Number one, Ezra and Thrawn come as a package. So the minute you see one, you see the other. Or um, Thrawn outsmarted Ezra somewhere along the line and dumped Ezra somewhere. Right. And, and then uh, Thrawn, Thrawn legged it and carried on his mission. Um, because ultimately, as soon as we see one, with the last time we saw them both, they were together. So yeah. you'd expect them to still be together if they have been separated. I can't see Ezra willingly you know, walking away from Thrawn. So Thrawn must have done something to lose Ezra. Um, I guess we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm excited for it, man. There's a lot of good stuff coming in. Thrawn and Ezra, man, that's part of it. Very, very excited for that. Uh, so let's get into video games. For once, we got a little bit of video game news. Uh, nothing really big, but I know there are some people that are going to be excited about this. Uh, what is, what's the name of the company? Zanga, I think is how you pronounce it. Zanga, Zanga has announced that they are working on a uh, on a Star Wars game for the Nintendo Switch uh, called Star Wars Hunters. And this is going to be along the lines of a, what would they say, an arena-based game? Uh, yeah. Pitting each so other against... A- there's no story to it. There's no canon story or anything. like No campaign, I guess. Um, but they... I, I think they put out a, a teaser video, didn't they, that was kind of teasing some of the characters that you could play as. Yeah, they, they've teased yeah. it as an online competitive arena combat. So I'm, I'm guessing one of the maps would be the Geonosis Arena, as right. an example, right? So it's just going to pit you, and I don't know how many players per match, but it's just going to be a bit of a, a team free-for-all, or, you know, um, I think it's just a, it's an exclusive to the Nintendo Switch. So the way I kind of look at it, this is your budget battlefront. Right. Well, it, you said exclusive to Switch. It's not, though. It's coming out on mobile, too. Oh, more one it's coming on. It's coming oh, okay. on a mobile but, and and Switch, yeah. But it's not coming to any other consoles. No, no, no platforms. No, no consoles. Yeah, so. I think it's just. I don't think the Switch could handle a Battlefront two. So I think Probably this is not, just yeah. the equi- I think this is just the equivalent. Poor man's you know, Battlefront to, to give the <laughs> to give them the the Switch owners a chance to get some some feeling of what Battlefront is like. Right. No, I I, I think you're right, but you know I was kind of surprised that they're not putting some kind of even if it was a a C grade story you know what I mean just something to it to kind of because odds are I'm probably not going to even I mean I'll probably check it out but I'm not going to spend hours upon hours playing it the way I have Jedi Fallen Order or Battlefront or Squadrons even you know what I mean so I I'll probably check it out but you would think they would add a little something in there for for uh for the story lovers but I mean I'm honestly, I'm putting this in my mind as kind of the. Uh, you remember that mobile game that came out right when the canon thing started? It, um, Uprising. You remember Uprising? that? Yeah. Never had it. Um, I, I remember it at the time, but I'm not really one for mobile gaming. Same. So it's not something that I really took too much of an interest in. Um, had I known it was officially canon, um, I don't know if it's still considered canon, but I think at the time when I learned it was canon, I went back to take a look for it, and I couldn't find it anyway. They They'd been taken down. They pulled it down because it didn't get the reception like they thought it would. I played it for a little while, um, but it just it was just so repetitive, and really there was there wasn't a whole lot of story to it at all. Um, it was one of those things where it's kind of like the first Battlefront was canon, where it was more the locations and the battles were canon, but there was like no story to it whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it played for a while, but I think they had Uprising up for maybe maybe a year and a half. I think max, year max, I think I want to say, before they took it down um, and it went offline. But like I said, it just didn't get the reception. And I'm, I don't, I don't want to say this one's going to be the same because it's not just exclusive to, to mobile. It, like you said, it's the Nintendo Switch also. Um, and if I end up playing it, it's going to be on mobile. Uh, I'm not going to go buy a Switch just to play this on the Switch. You know what I mean? 
Um, but it's set to release at the end of 2021. Uh, if you guys have a Nintendo Switch, it gives you a reason to be excited. So, uh, yeah, that's really, like I said, I'm kind of indifferent about this one, uh, mainly because of the lack of story, because I was burned with the first Battlefront. So, I uh, I, I, I guess, uh, are you sitting along the same lines as I am then? Yeah, I mean, I my daughter has a Switch, yeah. though I can't see me purchasing a game uh, just, just, just for, for this, it. you know. Yeah. Um, I may pick it up if this comes out, if it's on mobile. It's a good possibility I'll pick it up um, if it's a free download where you, if it's like a, a free download where you can have say one match to try it out and then you gotta pay the money then for all the create customized options. Right. Then I might just play it to the free bit to see what it's like and then just delete it. Right. Just to, just be, costs, just so we can say we checked it out. If it's anything yeah. more than five dollars, I ain't bothering. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just something like that. Like, now, if I had, like I said, if I had a story with it, and it had a campaign, I'd be willing to to check it out a little bit more. But not everything, I guess, has to be story. You know, gear, story geared. You can put stuff out for who, people who don't give a crap about story. You know what I'm saying? And just want to. I don't want to say a mindless shooter, but that's really kind of the only thing yeah. I can call it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, yeah. Admit it. When you're playing a shooter game, you're just you're gone, you know, you're just, you're just focused. So I, I call them mindless shooters. Yeah. As I was saying earlier, I think this is just your budget battlefront Yeah. for those who can't play battlefront because they don't have the console yep. or, you know, the, or the, the PC to play it on. And I think that's just really what it is. It's just a, it's just a budget battlefront one. Poor man's battlefront. Fair um, enough. Yeah. I, I don't think it's going to be anything more than that. Fair enough. Well, there is all of your news for this week. And actually, there was quite a bit this week. I'm kind of surprised. Next week, we won't have a damn thing. I guarantee it. There won't be anything to talk about news-wise. Let's get into mailback questions. This will be the second half of the show. we got four mailback questions lined up for you. How do you guys get a question on the Star Wars Canon Podcast? You can email it to us at StarWarsCanonPodcast at gmail.com. You can send it to us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Podcast. You can send us a voice message on the uh, Anchor app or anchor.fm slash Star Wars Canon Podcast. Or if you are a member of our Discord server, we've got a channel on there. You can go and add mailback questions there as well. So like I said, we've got four lined up this week. Let's get into these. Question number one this week comes from Kyler Knowles. You guys have heard that name before. And uh, Kyler says, hello there, Brian and podcast gang. I just recently finished Light of the Jedi and issue number one of High Republic. And was wondering, who are your guys' favorite characters so far? There are lots of great characters to choose from and can't wait to see your guys' answers. Thanks for the question, Kyler. Jay, would you like to take this one first? Yeah, I'm, uh, I've am i only got Light of the Jedi. My other books, Into the Dark and Test of Courage, arrived earlier today. Um, so I haven't had a chance to open them yet. But so far, I think my favorite character is Avar Chris. Avar Chris. Mm -hmm. I am going to have to go with Loden Greatstorm. He is the Twi'lek that you see on the cover of Light of the Jedi. I really dig his Jedi training methods. I really, really, really dig him. Uh, I don't want to get too spoilery with him, but to give you kind of an idea, if you guys haven't picked it up yet and kind of want an idea of what Loden Greatstorm is like, uh, he's got a bit of a dry sense of humor. Uh, he's, he's kind of compassionate, not so much. His Padawan is having this particular problem with catching himself with the Force, falling from great heights and, and slowing himself down and not, you know, splattering like a bug on a windshield. For some reason, he just can't pick this up. And at one point, he's trying to teach his Padawan. He's like, look, I believe in you, and just uses the Force and literally throws him off of a cliff. I That's Jedi training I can get behind. I'm digging the crap out of Loden Great Storm. Uh, I'm at uh, where I'm at in light of the Jedi right now. I thought I'd be done with it by now, uh, but I'm not. I just finished part two. I'm getting ready to start part three. Uh, so if that kind of gives you an idea of where I'm at right now, Kyler have not read the comic yet. I got the comics, uh, and I started to read issue number one and like page two, there were spoilers for the end of the novel light of the Jedi. So I'm like, well, I can't read these until I finish light of the Jedi. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to finish this and then get into the comics and 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 kind of expand my knowledge of that of that time period a little bit more, um, but obviously I haven't started Into the Dark yet or Test of Courage, so I'm I'm far behind. Like the last two weeks for me, 
uh, I've I've had hardly any time to read or catch up on anything Star Wars mm-hmm. uh, related. So I'm I'm getting there. I'll get caught up. Uh, come back and ask me that question here in a couple of few weeks, and uh, maybe the answer will change. I don't know, but I'm I'm digging mm-hmm. loading great storm, man. Yeah, you, you reminds me a bit of John Wayne. Do you remember that? Yeah, John? I can't remember the name of the film. It's a John Wayne film, and he's talking to this kid, and the kid says he can't swim. The young boy, and he picks this boy up by the scruff of the neck in the jeans <laughs> and throws him into a pond. Just kick your legs, kick your legs. The kid learned how to swim. Just drowning in a pond. Do you know the film I'm talking about? I, it's an old I vaguely remember a scene like that, but I don't remember which one. My my great grandfather was huge John Wayne into John Wayne, yeah. And I, I, yeah, I swear just, I've seen that scene before when I was. I mean, I was just like a youngling, but but yeah, I, I vaguely sure remember can, that. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. Just oh, type yeah. in John Wayne drowns a child. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> training I can get behind though, I, and I mean that because. What better way? I mean, I'm a very trial by fire person. I'm I'm that kind of person. Just throw you in because that's how I learned how to swim. Somebody just kicked me into the pool one day. I was blue jeans, boots. I learned how to swim instantly. You know what I'm saying? So that is training I can get behind. I'm digging him, you know, and especially I'm not going to tell you how that situation ended up because that would be a bit, a bit of a spoiler. But the the what he did afterwards and kind of what he had planned, it you just couldn't help but laugh. And just his stoic kind of, like I said, his dry sense of humor, how even when he's disappointed in his Padawan, he's still got that grin on his face like, eh, you'll get him. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I'm i digging him. I'm digging him. Like you said, though, Avar Chris is a great character as well. Um, she's kind of, like like I said before we started recording, I compare her as kind of the Bastila Shan from the Knights of the Old Republic as, as Avar Chris is to High Republic. Um, yeah, well, there, there is yeah. certain moments within the book that sort of allude to that as well, isn't it? Yeah, there are. Um, um, I don't know how far to talk about this. I don't know if it kind of borders on spoiler territory, but um, there, there is one specific moment early on in in the book, uh, which to me screamed Bastard Ashan. Yes, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about too. Yeah, 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 you get me. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And yeah, and then that, I think that's what she's meant to be, to be honest. I think she's that Bastila character. I, uh, with the whole High Republic thing, because I wanted to talk about this question a little bit, because last week the guys talked about High Republic in depth, and, and you and I didn't really get to, to kind of give our thoughts on High Republic, so I really wanted to touch on this a bit. Some of the things that I've kind of gathered from Light of the Jedi so far, and I don't think this is, I don't think this is spoilery at all, We've talked about how we've had theories that this because I've got Light of the Jedi right here. Um, we, we've we've had theories that this was Disney's version of Old Republic, right? And then we also have talked about how well, no, the Old Republic had, had to have happened well before all of this. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's another time period they could get into. Some of the comments that I've seen in Light of the Jedi from Jedi to other people and and some of the things that people have talked about lead me to believe that there is no old republic um talking about how you know hyperspace travel is still so new and that the republic is still coming together and that mm. you know you know what I'm talking about and how just there was one character who is 300 years old and even in those 300 years you know he says back 3 centuries ago there was not there was no you know, planet to planet travel or anything like that. So how is there a Republic if this is all still so new? You know what I'm saying? So I'm I'm wondering, am I just missing something? Or is this literally, like, are they trying to tell us this is their version of Old Republic now? It could very well be. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't I, yeah, know I don't know. That's, that's what I'm saying. I like, it's it's um, kind of a hypothetical at this point because but, uh, yeah, they've dropped these nuggets and I, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the points that you mentioned there, where they do talk about hyperspace travel being relatively new, and um, a lot of these hyperspace lanes are completely unmapped, right? Or some of them, they just don't yet understand the con, you know, concepts of the hyperspace travel. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but I mean, a thousand generations—that's more than two hundred years. Right. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Yeah. So, I mean. Certainly, there may not be necessarily a republic, you know, as such. You know, going back to you know, uh, so much earlier than than these novels are set, 
but um, I don't, you know, there's obviously got to be something mm -hmm. to, and something's got to happen to yeah. set the galaxy up where they think, right, we need to unify as a republic into a government. Right? Can you That's have it. a can you have a Jedi Order without a republic? I don't see why not. Maybe the Jedi Order established the republic. Maybe then separate. You know, yeah, it, it's entirely possible, but but. Guys, if you're not reading Light of the Jedi, and, and Jay, I know you said you're kind of having a little bit of a rough time getting through it. Yeah, yeah. I, initially, I thought, you know, working from home since March 2020, I, I thought maybe it's kind of dampened my mood a little bit, and that could still be possible. But, you know, as I mentioned to you just before we started recording, I'm reading this book, and it's just going in one year, in one year and out the other. I've not taken anything in from this book. So, um I don't know. I might just audio book the rest. I'm on chapter 28 right now. <coughs> and aside yes, from, I couldn't tell you any of the characters' names aside from Ava Chris. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I know about the uh, the Starlight Beacon. You know, but right. a lot of it is it's not sticking, man. For me personally, it's just going in one year out and coming out the other year. See, I'm so, I'm almost the complete opposite. I, I started off that way. Don't get me wrong. I, like the the first part of the Great Disaster had me hooked. And then when you get towards the final kind of parts of that, it kind of lost me for just a little bit. And then now it's slowly starting to like draw me back in. I'm starting to get back into it. Uh, had I reviewed the book after part one, I'd have been like, eh, it's all right. You know, but it, now that I finished part two, I'm like, this is getting good because I'm really loving the Nile. I'm loving the Nile as as a, a villain, you know, and as this villainous organization that the Jedi are gonna go up against. And I'm 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 loving it. I'm I'm the complete opposite, man. I'm I'm really digging where it's going. If you guys have not started the High Republic stuff, do yourselves a favor. As far as this is my opinion, not necessarily Jay. The views that I put out do not reflect those of Richard Jay. My view is you guys need to go check this book out. At least Light of the Jedi, kind of see if you use that as like a testing water to kind of see if you want to dip your toes into the rest of that era. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I'm, I'm loving the crap out of it so far. And really Jay, I think you're the first person that has really had anything. I don't want to say negative, but anything other than positive to say about it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to downgrade the book, mm -hmm. you know, as I said, you know, as I said earlier, it could just be, where I am currently, you know, just right. stuck at home, you know. Right. Um, uh, maybe I just need to change up a few things, you know, in my life. Hopefully, we can get back, I can get back to work soon. Um, but um, I'll read it again, you know. Um, I'm not just going to abandon the novel. Oh, I man, want yeah. to, you know, this is this is the start of, you know, of, you know, of, of what a five, six year saga. You know, oh yeah, three phases. New, yeah. You know, this whole new three phase saga. So. You know, I want to get in on on a good foot, on a good inning. So yeah, um, I'll you know the, the so I don't know. If I'm, I think at the moment I'm sort of treating it in my mind. You know, specifically the first part, a bit like aftermath, the first novel. It's just like a reference book. It's just setting up. Here's this person. This right, is what right. I put that out. Here's this. This. It's just sort of setting up the sort of um, setting up the universe, or the galaxy, as to right. This is where we're at. Mm -hmm. This just, is what we're just doing. Kind of this establishing it. it, right. So, you know, I'm definitely going to, you know, at, at the later stage, once I finish this book, I'm going to move straight in into these two new ones. And I hope then at one point to go back and, uh, you know, just give parts two and parts three another go with mm -hmm. uh, Light of the Jedi. Fair enough. Well, Kyler, I hope that answers your question. Let us know, guys. If you're reading High Republic, drop some in the comments, guys. Let us know what your guys' favorite characters are. Uh, try not to be spoilery because I know a lot of people haven't really got it. I don't want to say a lot of people, but some people haven't really gotten into High Republic just yet. Um, I definitely think this is something you probably need to get into pretty quick if you're going to do it instead of just playing catch up and sitting down and doing the whole thing eventually because I think it'll get tedious. Um, I definitely think this is something we need to just keep up with as we go. You don't want to get behind on this. So uh, like I am, I'm already two and a half books behind and I'm freaking out because i need to get caught up so uh kyler i hope that answers your question man thanks for sending it in uh and uh thanks man question number two this week comes from gerald wood and gerald says hey guys i was re-watching the rise of skywalker and realized that force ghosts never interfere in current events 
Uh, is there anything in canon that explains this? And if not, why do you think that is? Love the show, fellow Force users. Uh, thanks for the question, Gerald. Okay, so Force ghosts interfere uh, plenty. Uh, they, If it weren't for Force ghosts, the outcome of any of the trilogies would be massive. Uh, just because they're not physically interfering in events doesn't mean that they aren't I don't want to say manipulating, but kind of that's the only word I can think of manipulating or persuading somebody to do something or teaching them another lesson from beyond the grave. Um, Jay, am I wrong? I mean, because th th there's been some serious okay. moments where, you know, Obi-Wan telling Luke, you know, your, your twin sister and that whole conversation and, and Yoda yeah. talking to Luke, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's, there's so much to that. Yeah. Yeah. But then you look at the opposite, right? Look at Master and Apprentice, right? When Qui-Gon appears against Obi-Wan. Oh, yeah. You know, Qui-Gon says, oh, I, 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 worse to the effect of, I'll see you soon. Qui-Gon knows Obi-Wan's going to die if he doesn't tell him. Right. I think with this particular one, yes, we know that Force Ghosts can physically, you know, appear and interfere with the day-to-day -day running of things. But I think with Gerald, the way I interpreted your question, Matt, was how come... Force Ghost Anakin didn't just come in and just rip Palpatine's head straight off his shoulders. <laughs> now, I th we do see Yoda physically throw a bolt of lightning at a tree, so um, which is there to serve uh, Luke, like a final lesson to Luke. So that did affect the plot of the movie, because without that, Luke would never have appeared in Crate. So, uh, but we don't see that anywhere else at all. We, yeah, we see Jedi come back and talk, maybe have a bit of a one-to-one, -one, but Force Ghosts don't physically come back and alter dramatic events to such a degree where they would jump into a duel with somebody and take over. It could just be a little bit of creative licensing. There's nothing necessarily in canon that states a Jedi can't just come back and duel with somebody else. I think it's more to do with the fact that the Force wills it when the Force wills it, and if the force doesn't will it, it doesn't happen. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's a pretty cut and dry answer, actually. Yeah, like you said, there's nothing in canon that there's no rule. You know what I mean? Because the whole force ghost thing, honestly, if you look at the Star Wars universe, the force ghost thing is incredibly new to, well, yes, to, the, yes. to the universe as a whole. Because Qui-Gon was the first to figure yeah. out how to do it. And then, you know, we we saw Yoda and Obi-Wan, obviously, as force ghosts. And then Anakin, which still can't figure out how Anakin knew how to do it. But... Uh, it, what about Leia? <laughs> yeah, and Leia. You know what I'm saying? So, and then Luke, yeah. obviously. So, yeah, there's, I mean, Luke came back in episode nine, you know, and used the force to lift the X-Wing out of the water for Rey and, and gave her Leia's saber, you know what I mean? But it, if you look at the role force ghosts play, it's mainly educational for the most part. You know what I'm saying? They just give a little nudge here and there, but... Some of the time, some of, sometimes when they're really, I mean, the educational really turns into like, you know, oh, hey, Leia's your sister. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and yeah. giving the whole backstory of Anakin to Luke from Obi-Wan's point of view and the yeah. whole lesson of a point of view or Yoda telling Luke, you know, you should have gone with Rey. You know what I'm saying? Like you should have went yeah. with her because that's what the galaxy needs. Those are huge lessons and huge educational moments. That are galaxy yeah. changing. They really are. But like you said, you took it. You take it as more of like a literal sense. As, well, yeah, as the yeah. way I read the question was yeah. So you've got what you've just mentioned there, the sort of educational side. Right. But the way I interpreted the question was, well, how come the Force Ghost didn't appear with Ray, for example, right. when they were fighting? But she was fighting Palpatine. So you know that's the way I interpreted the question. Because right. yeah, you get the educational visits from the force ghosts uh, and they will impart some knowledge for that person to go off and do something but the force ghosts themselves don't physically do right. anything other than just you know talk aside from Yoda which struck a bolt of lightning against a tree that's the first time in canon that we've seen a force ghost actively do something other than just impart a little bit of knowledge right um, you know uh, so in regards to a force ghost physically being there to alter a chain of events, um, I think really is, I don't think there's nothing in Star Wars can that rules that out. Right. I just think at the moment it's just a little bit of creative licensing. They've not done it, and um, until we ever see such a thing happen, 
I'm just going to chalk it down to the force hasn't willed this into existence yet. Fair enough. Because, I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, look, if force ghosts could do that, you could have an army of force ghosts with lightsaber. Nobody's going to die. You know, <laughs> like you're not going to lose that battle. So I think it's just too easy of an out to have them do anything, to be honest. Is it a plot hole? Maybe. I don't know. It depends. But like you said, I think it's just creative licensing. So um, I hope that answers your question, Gerald. Uh, let's get on to the third question. Question number three this week comes from Blake Reynolds. And Blake says, hey, Brian and crew, how are you? Came across your show about a year ago and never missed an episode or video. Uh, it's truly refreshing to have a positive outlook on Star Wars nowadays rather than everyone shitting on the franchise. Thank you. I appreciate that, actually. That's exactly what we try to do here. Uh, I just got done with issue 11 of the Star Wars comic. I wanted your thoughts on it. Seems like the Rebellion is dabbling in that gray area again, and I love it. Keep doing what you guys do. Thanks for the question, Blake. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what's going on, uh, we might talk a, a, a couple spoilers here for, uh, I almost said season 11, I wish, of uh, uh, it's issue 11 of the Star Wars comic. Uh, we are at a point now, the Star Wars comic, like we said earlier, is taking place between Empire and Jedi. And where we're at in this particular story, uh, Lando and Lobot are now with the Rebellion, still not trusted, uh, rightfully so, I think, at this point. Uh, but yeah, the rebellion is starting to dabble into this gray area where do we want to say that they were willing to sacrifice Lobot's life or did they know that he was going to be okay? Mm. Cause well, I don't know. I, I don't know how to take that because if you look at the conversation that, um, like Leia and 3PO had for those of you that don't know, okay, we, we got to give a little backstory here for a second. Cause it's going to seem really weird if we don't. Uh, if we're talking about this and it's just it, none of it makes any sense. Um, basically, what's going on in the comic right now is the Empire has uh, broken the encryption on the Rebellion communications. And so the Rebellion cannot come all, all come back together after Hoth and, and reestablish themselves as a fleet without the Empire showing up and just wiping out whole divisions. So the Rebellion at this point has found this old, like, Mark II astromech droid, ancient, ancient thing. Or not astromech droid, protocol droid, sorry. Uh, that has this old, ancient language that nobody even knows of anymore. And I don't even remember what it's called. Uh, but 3 PO was trying to get this droid to teach him the language so that they can encode all of their communications with this language. Now the Empire can't, can't figure out what they're trying to say. And this droid... Uh, can only think straight while was it while Lobot is like focused and trying to keep all of his neuron and like neurons like firing right, get his brain, his positronic brain right. Um, I think that's, I think if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, Jay, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. But Lobot was like really focusing on keeping that droid focused and it was going to kill him. And Lando was trying to get him to stop. And uh, basically, Lando gets held at gunpoint by Cast Dan- uh, uh, Dameron. Uh, trying to keep Lando from stopping what's going on. So that's kind of that gray area. Do you think they were really going to let Lobot die, Jay? Well, this goes back to something that I believe was touched on in Bloodline. Um, I'm trying to think of any other novel it could have been touched in, but I I can't see it happening. Um, so I'm sure it's Bloodline. It's either Bloodline or Moving Target. Okay. And there's a, there's a line in there which talks about Leia was only able to sustain herself throughout the entire galactic civil war by um, subconsciously drawing on the dark side of the force, Mm -hmm. which is why she was able to strangle Jabba the Hutt. I'm pretty sure that was in Uh, Bloodline because I think think it was when they were talking about her, her nickname Hutt Slayer and and everything like that. I think it it has to be in Bloodline because moving target, you know, is set before, you know, Return of the Jedi. Right. They're in the same time period. Yeah. Because in in that novel, that's where she steals the um, the Lambda shuttle. You know, that's when they steal the Lambda shuttle that they use in Return of the Jedi. Right. Um, But, um, you know, it's, we've, you know, we've seen it in Rogue One that the Rebels, you know, I know when you watch the original trilogy movies, everything is nice and then everything's evil. There's a clear distinction between the two. But with Rogue One, bringing in those elements that mm, no, the Rebels can do just as much evil as the Empire. Um, seeing Leia um, just basically say, yeah, okay, 
it's not nice, but we've got to do it. Well, that kind of falls in line as to what Claudia Gray said about Leia. She sustained herself with the entire war mm -hmm. by subconsciously drawing on the dark side of the force. So to me, it's like, well, yeah, that's, I would expect her to be like that. Knowing what we know about the Rebel Alliance now, all right, is if they, if we forego Rogue One, if that movie had never been made, right, and this is the first instance that we get of the Rebels doing some dark, dark stuff, you know, that'd be, oh, wow, you, you're jumping straight off the bat with Leia doing that? No, not a troop, Leia's doing it? But the fact that we've seen already that the Rebel Alliance will do what needs to be done, then, you know, it's not a big shock. You know, I, you know, I, truly, I think it's it's in keeping with Leia's character. You know, it's it's not necessarily that she takes joy in it; it's the fact that it needs to be done. Right. And I think, yeah, you know, it. it she could have gone all the way. She could have gone all the way, and said, "Look, I'm I'm, so, I'm sorry, Lobot is uh, is uh, has been fried, but it had to be done. It could have. I would have." Yeah, it could have gone all the way, and I think it still would have been in keeping with the character. It's not necessarily what's being done. It's her attitude towards what's being done. Right. And I thought the comic did that pretty well. I thought, yeah, um, I thought so too, yeah. Oper was it Operation Starlight Part 3? I thought I thought they did it you know, really well, you know, given that, right, this is the situation that we're in. Right, how do we deal with it? Okay, it's got to be done. For the mm -hmm. sake of the rebellion, it's got to be done. Yeah. Well, and you also have to keep in mind also, this now has caused a deep rift. I mean, there already wasn't any really good cohesion there, but a good relationship. But it's caused a deep rift now between Lando and the rebellion. Because... Yeah. Because remember, like, <laughs> we used to talk about all the time, there's only a year between Empire and Return of the Jedi. And how is it that the guy that gave up Han and Leia and Chewie to Darth Vader is magically a general... And the rebellion in the very next movie, you see, you know what I mean, and and so there there was a lot there of him gaining trust and whatnot. And, and when it started, Lando really wanted to gain the trust of the rebellion, and now it's completely flipped to where Lando has no trust of the rebellion whatsoever. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious as to see how they're going to bring this full circle and convince him to end up being General Calrissian, you know, and and and, and you know, I I I don't know how it's going to go because it's. That final line Lando gave Lobot, you know, he's like, well, I think we just learned something, you know, we know who we can and can't trust, and it's yeah, I mean, it's them, you know. The way, I could be wrong, but the way I always interpreted the movie is that Lando was made a general during the movie Return of the Jedi, after the operation to bring back Solo. Right. He was made a general, then he earned the trust, then he was made a general, and he was only really made a general because of the oncoming, the, the, the battle of Endor was, was about to start, and they mm -hmm. needed leaders. Um, but I mean, with, with go, you know, going back to to you know to, to Gerald's question, um, go back to a new hope. When the Death Star blows up Alderaan, yeah, Leia, what does she do? She she freaks out as expectedly as you'd expect her to act, mm -hmm. and then she's she doesn't let on to over it. Anymore. Yeah, she's over it. She's got that senator's composure. And that's exactly what she has here in this comic. She's got the senators. She's got her mother's composure. Mm -hmm. It's killing her on the inside. It's tearing her apart. You can see that in that in that frame of her, where she's got that side glance where she's looking towards Lando. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can see it's killing her on the inside, but she's got the senator's composure on. It's like, no, it's got to be done. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the the fact that they're dabbling in that gray area again, I I love it when they do that. Because like, like you said earlier, the Rebellion and the Empire used to be very cut and dry, black and white, good, bad, you know, good, good and evil. And Because some of the opening crawls even say the evil Galactic Empire. And, and But now, like you said, with Rogue One, really opened up that door. And even, not even really Rogue One was as the start of it. Really, like you said, Moving Target, that novel was kind of the start of that. You know, where the Rebellion was using this mass of civilian ships as like a decoy to be able to amass their own fleet near Sullish. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that that was kind of the first instance of that. And yeah, I love it when they do that because war is not I mean, they're adding a realistic spin to it. War is not all just cut and dry. Do the right thing all the time. You know what I mean? You 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 can't. Yeah. And 
the fact that they're introducing that into this, it, it just makes sense and it feels natural. And it just, it, it, it's absolutely amazing. And it adds to the testament of who Leia is. Like you said, with her character, it really keeps it consistent with like what Bloodline said, where she was tapping into that the whole time and what really sustained her. It, it just, it's consistent for me. So I absolutely love it. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I want to see more. This is why I'm so excited for the Andor show. I'm so excited to see, because Andor said during Rogue One, we've all done things we're not proud of. Yeah. And we've done assassinations and, and, and all these other things. And that's what that shows. I'm so excited for Andor. And I, I think people are, I don't want to say all people, but I think people are looking at it as, ah, oh, it's just the guy from Rogue One. I don't care. But when you really like break it down and start thinking about what that show is going to be, a political thriller, spy thriller, you know, and, and showing all these gr these these gray areas where the rebellion is operating. Yeah. Sign me up, man. I'm excited. So, yes, Blake, absolutely excited to see that gray area being dabbled in again. Absolutely right there with you. Thank you for the question. Do appreciate it. Uh, and the final question this week before we wrap up is from Tim Peterson. And Tim says, hey, Brian and crew, what are your top five stories in the novels, video games, movies, etc.? Uh, I've been a fan of your channel on uh, channeling on five years now. Thank you for being the light side of the force in this darkness of the fandom. Keep up the great work. Uh, Jay, I'm going to let you start this one because uh, I, I've got a list here of, from like each medium, I guess you could say, each of the five main mediums. Uh, kind of what our news is kind of broken into you now and my favorite story out of all those, but I'm going to, I'm going to let you go first on this one. Okay. So yeah, I've done the same. So in terms of novels, Lost Stars, you know, cut and dry winner there, I think for a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, in terms of TV, my favorite arc, more arc from the Clone Wars, although that was, that to me is what solidified the Clone Wars as serious storytelling. Um, films, Return of the Jedi. Uh, games, really, I mean, you don't really have much in the way of canon video games to have much of a choice, really. It's, it's either one or the other. It's either, well, you, you've got Fallen, uh, Fallen Order, you, uh, which um, is the only real in-depth campaign. Battlefront 2 campaign got pretty much squashed after the... Um, the debacle with all the uh, what are they calling those um, uh, pay to win scenarios and all of those uh, right. the microtransactions, microtransactions. Yeah. we're going to go towards funding all the DLC that come with it because it was supposed to be a 30 year campaign and all we got was the um, the end then they said right that's it strike a line under it and they just gave us the final mission um, you know for squadrons you know they made it clear from the very beginning it's a mini campaign. Mm -hmm. Effectively, it's just a training campaign with a couple of levels towards the end where it's just a free-for-all. Um, so really, the only canon story, in-depth story you can go off is only one to pick from us, Fallen Order. Um, the, in terms of comics, then, the fifth one, that's got to be the current run of the Darth Vader comics. Without a shadow of a doubt, the current run of the Darth Vader comics is just insane. So... Yeah, we're going to talk about that Vader comic here in a second because I agree with you on that for the comics. My list is not very different from yours at all. Uh, there's, It's the same except for two of the mediums. Uh, favorite novel is obviously Lost Stars. I mean, that is still, to me, gold standard Star Wars novel writing. I just Claudia Gray is the queen of, of, of canon. Uh, video games, yeah, I'm going to have to go with Jedi Fallen Order. Squadrons was good, um, but... And the Battlefront campaign was good too, but I I love Fallen Order. I love the the potential that that story has to be you know a, a franchise in and of itself for sequels and just everything about that game is just great. And and there's some things that could be improved upon, but not much. Like there's there's really good things in that game. Um, so yeah, novels is Lost Stars. Games uh, is Jedi Fallen Order. Films I'm gonna go with Rogue One because I absolutely adore Rogue One. Um, and it's, it's just, and, and for me, Rogue One and Empire Strikes Back, back, go back and forth, depending on what kind of mood I'm in, I guess. Um, so, so take that as you will. Uh, my favorite television arc though is different. I just absolutely love the Siege of Mandalore in season seven of Clone Wars. Uh, everything about that is just 
the way it Four. crosses over with three and seeing Order 66 from Ahsoka's point of view, seeing Maul mm. terrified of what's getting ready to happen and saying, yeah. you know, we're all going to die, you know, and, and, and everything. Just the cinematography of that storytelling, it just, it, you look at the first episodes they released of Clone Wars compared to that seventh season, it doesn't even look like the same show. It's oh, just, yeah, it, yeah. it's evolved yeah. so much. And, and it's, and that story ending with that kind of look and that aesthetic and that story and that kind of writing and just all of it, the fact that they motion captured the lightsaber battle between Maul and, and Tano, absolutely a door siege of Mandalore. I mean, hands down, yeah. bar none. Um, yeah. And then for the comics, I'm I'm with you. The current Vader run, man. This run is absolutely sick so far. Yeah, absolutely I mean, siege sick. Of siege of Mandalore, you know, yeah, it, it is it's perfection. Right? It's, it, in my opinion, it is flawless. For me, the reason why I picked the Mortis arc was the same reason why I picked Return of the Jedi. Because it was that defining moment to me where I thought, this is brilliant. Oh yeah, yeah. You know I mean? that. So it'll always have a sweet spot. But right. Jedi Jedi for me was the first Star Wars film I saw. So I saw them completely out of order. Um, but Mortis arc for me was when I really saw the Clone Wars potential. So while yeah, I agree, Siege of Mandalore is like the pinnacle of the Clone Wars TV right. show. It literally it couldn't have ended on a better note. Um, you know uh, that show. That was like the perfect ending to the entire the entire run of the show, but I had to go Mortis Arc purely because Mortis Arc was where it really started for me. So I, I got to give props, man. Props where props is doing Mortis Arc to go take. That's me. fair enough, man. I'm not gonna argue with you because the Mortis trilogy is really good too. And without the Mortis trilogy, we wouldn't have a lot of some of the other stuff that we've gotten. You know what I mean? The the world between worlds, the rebels, you know stuff. There, there's a lot of good stuff, man. And I'm not going to argue with you. The, the Mortis trilogy is definitely up there. Absolutely. But, dude, this Vader comic, we got to talk about this damn thing because <sighs> holy crap, man. Is this comic, like, is every issue of this comic just gets cooler and cooler <laughs> and cooler. And you don't think it can. And then the next episode comes out and says, watch this. And then there it is. Or the next issue, not the next episode, but the next issue comes out and you're like, yeah, here you go. Holy crap, dude. What are we up to now? I think issue 10 just came out. It's issue 10. In yeah. The, fire, the red horror. Yeah, man. Vader chokes a reaper, a mass effect reaper sized Dalek. Basically, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not the Dalek machine itself, the creature inside the Dalek. I, everyone's saying it's a squid. It looks nothing like a squid. It's no. got tentacles, but the top part, nah, that's not a squid. That's a Dalek. Yeah. BBC is going to be on board. Now it's like, oh, where's my money? Where's my money for the Dalek? Hey, you never guess what? This is a Dalek, right? You could see a red. You could see a, a blue police phone box on Exegol. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I, dude. So, for those <laughs> that of you, went completely over your head. Then, wait, what you? did you say? Oh, the blue box on Exegol. Yeah. No. It, yeah. That, it, a blue police phone box on Exegol. I. I <laughs> oh my God! It really does look like a Dalek. You're not wrong. Uh, Kirsty, I showed it to her, and she described it as something different i'm not going to tell you guys what she described it as uh i told jay uh but it's it's a a piece of female anatomy but anyway so this thing is this whole issue was just insane um and we're really starting to get some connections with the sequel trilogy here uh remember this one's taking place also between empire and jedi uh, we, we've got Ochi uh, as, as being a part of this too with, with Vader and where we're at now it, it, like, like I said every issue gets cooler and cooler and cooler and we're getting to a point now where we, we're really going to start learning I don't want to say learning because we know how it happened but I mean getting the details I think and the meat on what the Emperor's plan was and how he ended up surviving and, and making it into episode 9 which I'm I'm terrified sitting here thinking about it. I, I'm terrified that it's going to cause an even bigger plot hole at some point. But I'm 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 willing to ride this wave and see where it ends up. And I'm hoping I'm hoping Vader doesn't learn everything and, and and all of these secrets. I'm hoping he doesn't because then you know all these videos we see of Anakin's Force Ghost leaning over and telling Obi, "We're going to tell him the Emperor survived." Nah, we'll just let him find out in thirty years. Like like that's going to make more sense. You know what I'm saying? Like those are going to have more credence lean to him so i'm well, hoping i'm hoping that this yeah 
that leads itself back to Gerald's comments because as force ghosts, they are just physical manifestations of the force. Yeah. So they know they know full well Palpatine's not dead. Just the same way as Qui Gon knew in Master and Apprentice that Obi Wan was about to and die. couldn't tell him, but just couldn't. Could, yeah, right. That's it. Couldn't couldn't say anything. Which is why I was saying earlier, it's either a bit of creative licensing where they further on down the line make a story and you think, oops, that, well, why didn't this person just say? So why I right. said earlier, the Force willed it to happen this way. The Force willed it so the ghosts just wouldn't say anything. Right. Because it's what you're seeing, yeah, what you're seeing is Anakin Skywalker in front of you or Obi-Wan Kenobi, but it's not them. It's the Force that you're seeing mm -hmm. projecting itself through that you know that through, through their essence corporeal yeah. form through that form yeah um and I, I don't know if you know i know yeah they say you can will yourself into to this immortality you can learn this immortality and will yourself back which is cool but you know you can only do that if the force wills it because if the force wants balance you know it's this person wins or loses because the force dictates that they win or lose like just as the force dictates whether or not someone's going to be strong in the force you know um yeah. the way they do it now with the, with the whole if you remember when we go back to rebels um where uh sabine picks up the dark saber and during the episode she said oh it, it feels lighter all of us you know it's getting lighter and that's where kana says oh you're, yeah you're connecting with the blade mm -hmm. you know which you know it kind of put a new spin on the whole force thing because although it's always been said it flows through all living things the whole concept of when well, everybody's got an attachment to the force, you know, you, with training, you could tap into it. Anybody could, um, not necessarily Jedi level, right. but anybody can tap into it. That's only something that's come about with the new canon. You know, it was never like that before. It was, yes, everyone's connected in the force, mm -hmm. but you know, you could feel it. You know, it'll take training to feel it, but you might not necessarily control it. So, um, sorry, it, it's, it's a, it's a bit of an up in the air concept, really, mm -hmm. because it's a lot of back and forth. And, but uh, I loved the shots of Vader um, flicking through all the memories yes. and all the things, all the scenes changing. We, um, the know, alternate like, outcomes. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Which, for me personally, you know, you uh, that one part of the comic where um, Luke cuts his hand. Luke cuts Vader's hand off instead of Vader cutting yes. Luke's hand. Off. Yes. The, you know, and he sees the image of Luke and Palpatine walking off together. Mm -hmm. Now put yourself in the position now. Vader right, is going to be in this mindset now, right? That um, he knows what could come to pass. He knows that he could die at the hands of Luke, and Luke forced the dark side. You know what? What pride he must feel. In Luke at the end of Return of the Jedi. Yeah. You know when he unmasks Luke, uh, Vader at the end, he's like, You were right, you were right about me. If kind of you can, it feeds into all that pride that Vader has at the end of that movie. Yeah. You were yeah. right about me. You know, so now you've got something else now to tag on to Vader's emotions about his turn back to, to the light, to Anakin Skywalker. Well, see, these visions also connect back to the story. Um... Uh, I think it was what a uh, disturbance in from a certain point of view empire where the emperor is having, he's feeling this disturbance in the force about Luke and he's seeing this vision of what Vader wants. And he's seeing, you know, that, that it's Vader and Luke running everything from Coruscant after Palpatine's dead and, and Luke, it, they're running everything as father and son. And when he realizes that, you know, Padme is there also. He sees that this is just what Vader wishes and what he wants. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? What, what his perfect universe would be. And and so not only are you seeing uh, the Emperor kind of having these visions of what Vader wants, you're also seeing what Vader wants in another medium and in, in, in these visions. And, and, and maybe not necessarily exactly what he wants, but his fears of what could happen. Um, like that one, like you were talking about the visions he had, the one... Uh, the panel that really stood out to me was the one where he's, he's laying on his back and, and the lightsaber's just stabbing out of his chest and Luke's walking away with the Emperor. Mm. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And he's just laying there with his own blade that he built as Anakin Skywalker just just hovering above him, just cutting through him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And 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 loved it. Yeah. 
It's, but it goes back to what Yoda said. Always in motion, the future is. That's right. Yeah, I said, you get all these different visions, and, it, you know, yeah, the Force is willing all these different outcomes. You know, which one's going to be the one that, you know, obviously they all going to die. Uh, yeah, I'm loving it. I think this is the greatest comic series I've ever read. Yeah. This, yeah. Not just necessarily Star Wars, but just in general. You know, it, the, this we always... Vader run that we've now is, is perfect. We, we always seem to say that, too, about the Vader runs, because... The first Vader run, we were like, holy crap, this is great. The second Vader run, we're like, Jesus. It was like, hold my beer, here we go. Now, this Vader run is just, God, man, they keep getting better and better. And and, and every time they announce a new Vader run, I roll my eyes. I'm like, Jesus, another one? We're, we're, we're going to do another one? Like, God, because, you yeah. know, we've had Vader Dark Visions and Vader Down, and now three, three you know, runs of Vader, and, and Tales from Vader's Castle, Return to Vader's Castle, Shadows of Vader's Castle, Ghosts of Vader's Castle. Like, there's so much Vader stuff. Yeah. That is just everywhere. Yeah, you know, but so it, but I, it just keeps getting. Get it. God, that is. I was telling, I was telling somebody <laughs> about that the other day because I've got uh, this this kid helping me at work right now, uh, and and he's like eighteen or nineteen, and he's he loves Star Wars. He's, he's Star Wars, fuck badass. I'm like, yeah, I know, right? And we started talking about, it, and I started telling him about these Vader runs, and that was the one man. I told him about Vader down. I was like, that was my favorite Vader line of all time. That is my favorite Vader line. The I'm surrounded by nobody, nothing but fear and dead men. And it's close, close second is when Luke tells him, you killed my father. And he's like, I've killed many fathers. You're going to have to be more specific. Love that line too. And and it just seems like, first meet. yeah, yeah. And on, on Psy Moon 4. And, and so these Vader runs just keep getting better. And better. And not only the runs are getting better, but the runs themselves get better and better as they go. And it's just, I, I, I'm excited to see where this one's going to go eventually. I mean, obviously, we know we get to Return of the Jedi, but the ride getting there has just been insane so far. Because now when you watch Empire and you watch Jedi back to back, you know so much crap went down in between. And it's and not only with Vader and the Emperor, but with Vader and 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 Sabe and, and the whole backstory of Padme and everything like that. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. that, I mean, him going to Naboo and all this all of that happened in between and it's just it keeps like i said it keeps getting better and better this this is by far my favorite comic out of I think all my of favorite out of all the printed uh content for vader my favorite vader line has to come from the novel twilight company it's the only line he has in the entire novel the oh novel, the yes we Storms Echo Base, gets all the way into the back end of Echo Base and just grabs one guy by the throat and says, where's Skywalker? Yes. The only line he has in the entire movie. He didn't like, give a shit about anybody else. And I love yeah. how they sold the force choke where the guy, for the remainder of the novel, has a raspy had throat. A sore throat, a raspy yeah. throat, scratching for air the entire novel. It wasn't just one of those once and done things where he lets you go and you're perfectly fine and you're okay. Now this force joke had a ramification, has some repercussions for this guy, where he was lost his voice for the entire rest of the novel. And, and that's not the only instance we've seen that too, where somebody survived an encounter with Vader with with the force choke thing and had a. I mean, if you look at uh, Lords of the Sith, when he was. That badass scene that I always come back to in Lords of the Sith, my favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes in that book, is when Vader is like flying inverted, his TIE fighter above the other fighter, and he's force choking the pilot <laughs> from the other one. Yeah. And, and and she ends up surviving, but she ends up she has that sore throat too, the rest of the the book mm. too, until you know, a certain time a certain thing happens. But it's it, I it's it's there, you know, and it's very yeah, I just there's so many great Vader lines. And like I said, like I keep saying, this will be the last time I say it, guys. I'm sorry. I know I'm beating a dead horse. It just keeps getting better and better. It's like so, you you don't think you can top what's already come. And then they top it anyway. Let me ask you a question then, right? Yeah. Out of all mediums, right? Games, comics, everything. What's your favorite line of Vader dialogue? Oh, man. We've shit. We've talked about all the great, great, great ones. To so all Vader's lines, I Vader's movies. I have to go back. Look, out of everything, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Out of everything, I have to go back to Return of the Jedi, and it's 
the entire monologue, because it goes to my favorite lightsaber battle of all time. Luke and Vader, Return of the Jedi, and the Emperor's Throne Room. That is my absolute favorite lightsaber battle. And it's not just because, and, and yeah, it's not a flashy fight, but it's because of the emotion and what's at stake and like, and like and everything that's father versus son. And they know it at this point, you know, because, yeah, it was father and son in Empire, but Luke didn't know that, you know, and, and now that's this it. time yeah. it's father versus that's son. And, yeah. and, and Luke's fighting for Vader's soul. You know what I'm saying? Well, kind of like yeah. what Dave Filoni said, how that, that, um, that duel of the fates, it was all over Anakin. It was, it was all over the fate of Anakin and how it carries through to return of the Jedi. It does because Luke is fighting for his father, you know, and trying to, to win his father back. And that, in, when he finally says, I will not fight you. And that entire monologue that Vader gives right there, that give yourself to the dark side and, and just, you cannot hide forever, Luke. And just, just all of it. And, and, and talking about, you know, his sister and finding out that Leia is his sister. And he's like, so you have a twin sister and, you know, and Obi-Wan's failure is complete and all this. And then he, and then he says, you know, if you will not turn to the dark side, perhaps, perhaps she, she will. will. And I no! love that entire monologue everything he says there to goad luke to come out of hiding and to just do this and to mm -hmm. give it one last just i absolutely love it and i've got a theory about that as well i think and maybe i'm wrong but see, see if you can kind of see where i'm coming from on this i feel like at that point right vader had already made up his mind oh i don't want to say made up his mind but he was already right there on the brink of flipping and he wanted and maybe I'm completely wrong here, but he wanted Luke to be able to see what would happen if he did this, if he actually turned to the dark side and and what it would feel like and actually use that anger and, and those aggressive feelings that the Emperor wanted him to use so much. And so he goaded him and he antagonized him and got Luke to do that. And and at I mean, at that point, after Luke just completely wailed, I mean, just wailed on Vader, uh, just what Luke felt after that. And he realized that he was right there on the brink and that he was becoming everything that his father had been and that he was going down that exact same path. And that I think Vader knew that that's what Luke needed to not turn to the dark side. I don't think Vader wanted Luke to turn to the dark side for the emperor. I know he didn't. I just, I don't know. Am I, do you see where I'm coming from? Do you think I'm far off? Well, we, we, you know, we all know that Vader was conflicted. Oh yeah, um, the whole time. You know, Luke. If you were around before the prequels, Luke said it. I feel the conflict within you. Um, so I think the moment that Luke, uh, big pardon, sorry. I think the moment that Vader knew this is what he's got to do was when Luke was begging him after uh, Palpatine started shocking him with lightning. But the conflict was always there. Luke stated that in the. Um, in my favourite Star Wars scene of all time, which is when they're on the, the landing platform on Endor, when they're in the corridor, mm -hmm. when they're having that first conversation, real Jedi to Sith conversation, where Luke, you know, has, has gone from the aggressive, rushed, um, action-seeking adventure farm boy to the to stoic Jedi Knight. He's, he's zoned in on, yeah. not completely, but he's well, zoned yeah. in on his emotions, you know. He's got an under he still has a, He still has a wobbly moment, which yeah. we see in the throne room. <laughs> but he's, he's zoned in at that moment. Um, and again, if, if you were born with the prequels or you saw them first, Padme tells you, yeah, oh, there's good in him, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, not, that's, a, that's a good choice. That's a, uh, you, you didn't specifically state which line of dialogue. All but, of it. You know, I don't even care. The, just all of it. Just anything at all that's in that entire monologue. Interesting. I love interesting. it. Absolutely. It's my love Dave it. Filoni impression. Interesting. 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 Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, and don't get me wrong. All the other stuff we've talked about is just gold, just absolutely great stuff. Uh, but yeah, that, that whole thing with Luke and it's, and it, it goes to show it doesn't have to be the most badass lines. It's mm. just the emotion behind them. And maybe, you know, the, 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 the situation surrounding it, you know what I'm saying? And, and the circumstances, it's just all of yeah. that was just so powerful as far as I was concerned anyway. And it just, even now when I watch return of the Jedi, I, it, it's one of those beautiful moments to me where it's just, just perfect dialogue. 
I, every bit of that dialogue is literally perfect. There's two moments for me that stand out as the best dialogue for Vader, and they're both in Return of the Jedi as well. Yeah. Uh, number one, I can't think off the top of my head if it comes before or after, but Vader says, Obi-Wan has taught you well. Mm-hmm. And what does Luke do? This is either before or after, but Luke backflips up onto that catwalk to get the high ground. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. Um, but my, I think my favorite line of dialogue from from Vader has to be, just for once, let me look on you with my own eyes. That's good too, yeah. You know what I mean? There's it's some great badass dialogue. You know, like you said, golden Luke uh, under the under the stairs. Yeah. Um, you cannot hide forever, Luke. But for me, the perfect line uh, of the entire trilogy or the saga as a whole is that one line of dialogue just for once. Let me look on you with my own eyes. Yeah. It, it, it was his final words as Vader, too. It was it was the final time you actually hear that. That deep baritone, the James Earl Jones, you know, and that's, I that's mean, it, that's, yeah. that's it. And everything after that was, girl, my son, you know, and, and don't yeah. laugh at me because of my horrible, horrible Anakin. Yeah, there you go. You nailed it. Yeah, that's. No, I've got to save you. You're all right. But then I say, you see the pride in his face. You're yeah. right. You know, and then you come to, you know, you come to see this comic that we're talking about now. You know, um, how Vader sees this vision ending um, and how it turned out in, you know, in, in real life, you know, in, in, in the movies. That feeds into to, to Anakin's pride and love for his son. The fact that he did save him and he turned away from the dark side. Um, fair play to uh, S- Sebastian Shaw. Um, when the mask was taken off, you could see, you know, his eyes are all, they, they, they appear to be a little bit teary, a little bit watery eyes. Yeah. You know, he's, he's blatantly proud of, of what his son was able to achieve, albeit for the small brief moment before he died. Well, what do all fathers want for their sons? They want their sons to be better men than they are, you know? And that's what, that's what Vader got and Luke, you know? I mean, Anakin, Anakin fell. Yeah. Anakin fell to Palpatine. He he fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. You know, now granted, yeah. they had a, a, a long lasting relationship before that happened, and that kind of helped Anakin kind of make that final choice. Luke and Palpatine didn't have that. Yeah. But still and Luke was able to Luke grow beyond. Yeah. Exactly. To loosely quote Yoda. Yep. They are what we grow beyond. That's right. Well, I hope that answers your question, Tim. Uh, let us know, guys. What are your favorite stories in each of those five mediums, too? I'd love to read through those and see what you guys think. Thanks for tuning in this week. Jay, thanks for joining me this week, man, on uh, this episode of the podcast. Had a blast talking this week, man. Yeah, it's been great fun. It's been great fun. It always is. Whoopee! Or however he said it. I don't know. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Make sure to check out the Facebook page as well. Uh, for any news stories that we end up dropping. Usually if we drop a news story on there, we're going to end up talking about it on the podcast. So uh, definitely check that out as well. If you want to be a member of our Discord server, the link to that uh, server is on this YouTube channel as well. If you guys are listening on YouTube, if you're listening on one of the other platforms, the link for that Discord will be in the description of this podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning in this week. We sure do appreciate it. And until next time, guys, this is Brian and Jay signing out. May the force be with you guys. Always.